Hello and welcome to DefenseCon. That's right. We're not on ILW anymore. We're not doing the fancy schmancy fleet. We're here with Drake Interplanetary to tell you how to defend yourself. Uh, welcome to another floor tour, a lore floor tour, if you will. Uh, my name is Paul Berserker One Batman Shelley, your humble host and space bartender at the Astropub and your professor on Galactic Historian. Welcome. This is a short kind of off the cuff. I have some some notes here and such, but mostly just off the cuff. Look at the ships on the floor of any given event here at Defense Con, which is today and tomorrow or today the day you're watching this as well. Uh, so you can come down and rent a vehicle for 48 hours to enjoy yourself, but maybe you want to know a little bit more about Drake or a little bit know about the ships that you are renting. That's what we're here for. But if you want a more exhaustive look, I have almost a hundred various videos on the lore of Star Citizen and a few other universes, if you're interested. Up there, click that link. And of course, as always, we're live Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday on Twitch, mostly talking about Star Citizen and so forth. So, without any further ado, let's begin. Welcome to Drake Interplanetary Defense Con. Now, you may be wondering, why is Defense Con going on at the same time as ILW? Well, that's because um, Drake... They're not too well liked by the UEE. Drake got its start in 2845 when a Magnus engineer and her team, Magnus engineer, an engineer by the name of Dan Dredge, and her team put together a prospect team called the Cutlass Team to build a ship for the UEE. The UEE was looking for a rugged, easy to maintain fighter for use uh, with squadrons on the frontier, especially now that we're dealing with, especially in the UE at this time, you're dealing with a rebuilding time. Uh, the UEE, the new UEE was still very much trying to get itself off its feet. It had still had to deal with massive shortages of heavy lift cargo and full control of the government hadn't really been achieved yet. There were still factions and infighting all over the UEE because of the fall of the Mezzers. And as a result, they were looking for something to bridge the gap, something that they could give their frontier squadrons to use that didn't require a lot of maintenance because on the frontier you don't have a lot of logistic support. So something that wouldn't require a lot of logistical support that could be maintained and built uh, or maintained and run regularly. And so Jan Dredge and her team built the Cutlass for this project. While it was liked, it wasn't didn't win the, the contract. So in response, Jan decided just to release the Cutlass on the civilian market, thinking that it would do well because if the military wanted this, then the civilian market wanted it. And she was right. Lots and lots of militia, frontier militia, wanted the vehicle, the ship, because it was a utility craft and a fighter all in one. It did a lot of things that only the freelancer would eventually be able to accomplish in many ways. And it did so at a much lower cost and required much less maintenance with somewhat equal fuel capacity, arguably. So that kicked off Drake Interplanetary's run uh, where they played up the fact that they were rejected by the UEE. They're building ships for the common man, for the people who actually need the man, that kind of thing. So they've always been a rebel company, playing up on this rebel attitude. In fact, Drake Interplanetary was just an idea that they pitched because it sounded cool. <laughs> Not necessarily because it was it had meant anything. It was just this sounded more rebellious, and that was the kind of thing that they were going for. So without further ado, let's look at the ships of Drake Interplanetary and learn a little bit more about them, shall we? So to the right here, we have the Drake Cutlass and its various incarnations, the Cutlass Red and the Cutlass Blue. This is the Cutlass Black. Now, the Cutlass Black was first introduced in 2845, as we talked about before. It's gone through a couple different variations, but mostly it's stayed the same. It's a utility ship. It's a fighter. It has a little bit of combination of, bo of both of them. And it, its main attractiveness is its ruggedness. 
they're very simple. In fact, if you look on the inside of any Drake ship, you'll see how simple it is. Most of the Drake's internal systems aren't covered by paneling or anything that would protect it. You can see it's a lot more just exposed wiring, things that are, you know, you can get access to the, uh, to the, the stuff that you need to fix pretty easily. As a result, it was very easy to diagnose what was going wrong. Oh, look, this cable is, is messed, so let's, uh, let's replace the cable, sort of thing. Um, because there's not a lot of bells and whistles, it doesn't really care about looking good, it f met the requirements, the needs of many frontier space pilots, especially militia and security pilots. Um, and it became so popular that eventually they would release two different variants. The Cutlass Red, which works as an ambulance, and the Cutlass Blue, which works as a police um, vessel, a security vessel, dedicated security vessel. So whereas the Cutlass Black was designed for militia and public security, it was also designed as a possible search and rescue craft, or a, a transport, all those sorts of things. That, that interior cargo bay kind of may, allows it to be a little bit more diverse. Whereas the red and the blue swap out those cargo bays for something that was more distinctly bespoke, something that was designed to specifically do a job. With the red, it's two medical bays, and with the blue, it's cryopods to hold prisoners. So, with the success of the Cutlass, shortly thereafter followed the Caterpillar. Now, the Caterpillar was first built in 2871. This was designed to fill that need for heavy lift cargo. Now, whereas the Hull series would eventually fill this need by exterior cargo, what Drake was banking on was ruggedness, was utility. So they built a heavy cargo ship that was modular, like the Hull series, but internal, pressurized, with the same design aspects and aesthetics as the Drake Cutlass. In fact, pretty much what this is is a cutlass slapped to the side of a big long bar a barge of, of various materials. Uh, this ship itself, uh, this little command barge, is actually its own ship. Uh, it may, I think it may even have its own quantum and jump drive. I think it does, actually. You notice these engines here, this is just docked to this middle section and can be used as an escape craft or combat vessel. As you can see the little guns up here. It even has a tractor beam at the bottom right there. I believe that's the tractor beam right there. And has its own landing gear and such. So they built a small little craft attached to a larger vessel. And just like the, the Cutlass, the big driving factor was its simplicity. It's simple. It's rugged. It doesn't have any bells and whistles. It doesn't have safety precautions because those are expensive and those take a lot to maintain. Uh, and in response, or in, instead, they have modularity. Each of these cargo bays could be swapped out for other bespoke needs. Um, there's been some thoughts of uh, uh, recreation modules with bars and pool tables, additional sleeping quarters, um, possibly even fuel containers to allow for the the cut the uh, Drake caterpillar to fill many roles at once, making it a lot more valuable, especially for companies that have to operate in deep space in places where there isn't a lot of logistics, just like the Cutlass. So you can think of this as a more modular version of the Cutlass. It was what it was designed to do. Then we'll move all the way back down here and look at some of the other ships in Drake's line. First of all, let's look at the Herald. Now, one of the unique aspects of the Herald is, and the unique aspects of the Star Citizen universe is there's no faster than light communication, which means that all communications, including transactions, must be traveled, must travel the speed of light. So they either are going to travel the speed of light or they will be transmitted through physical, like carrying these messages to and fro. And they found that the systems that the um, UEE had built in order to maintain active communications had lag time because um, 
a message might shoot at the speed of light from relay to relay to relay to relay, but once it reached a jump point to allow that message to go faster than it could uh, otherwise if you just shot it out with, you know, <laughs> a, uh, uh, a beam of light out into another system, it had to be traveled through a jump point. So they would load that information onto a probe. That probe would then go through a jump point, go into another relay on the other side, upload its data, and continue to the relay. All along the way, it needed some time to be able to uh, encrypt, transmit, so on and so forth. This slowed the process down. So early on, humans realized that they could go faster if they just took data, stored it on a ship, and just gunned it. Fast ship with heavy amounts of protected servers, databases, filled with information from financial information to top secret and classified information, which is what the Mercury was designed to do. Now, one of the most common sites in terms of these couriers, these information runners, is the Herald, built essentially as a cockpit, a bunch of servers, and a giant engine. This is actually the engine on the back of the Cutlass, I believe, or the back of the, uh, the escape craft. Yeah, this is, the, this is one of the, the engines in the back of a Cutlass. That's not to a much smaller frame. It doesn't have a lot of weapons, but it doesn't really need to have weapons. Its main purpose, and you can see here, it actually has a data system on the outside, not on the inside. Um, its main purpose is just to run information as fast as possible to its location and do so at a cheap rate. Again, rugged, simple, you don't need safety precautions. That's the kind of thing that Drake builds. So this has been used far and wide for things like information running, but as well as to set up transmission, transmission locations, set up your own kind of ad hoc relay system, because it can also transmit data through its uh, internal systems. And then lastly, before we get into the, the snubcraft and the holographic craft, we'll look at the, one of the latest ships, the Buccaneer. Now, the Buccaneer was first built in 2930? No, they don't have it. They, we don't have a date for them. Uh, it, was, it was built uh, after the Herald and after the Cutlass and the, um, the Caterpillar as well because it was built specifically as an escort fighter. Now, in a time where you have the Gladius as the mainline fighter for the UE Navy, people were seeing the value of a light fighter, especially in a time when Aegis was on the decline and you needed, often needed something that could have similar punching power and maneuverability to the Gladius, uh, but you didn't often have the, the, the money to do so. So that is what the Buccaneers designed to do. This is essentially going to design to be a cut down Gladius, a simple, easy to maintain, rugged, dependable Gladius. And that's what it does. But it's also built to work alongside all of the other Drake ships. This is almost as fast as the Herald. These massive engines, which make massive targets, but are still massive engines, allow it to travel very, very fast. It can keep up to pace with its fastest ship, but also is designed to support and help main, help uh, protect cutlasses and especially caterpillars. There is a rumor that Drake has built a caterpillar module, which specifically is designed to house one of these bad boys, making it a pocket carrier. That's not a confirmed thing. It's just a rumor, <laughs> uh, but. It would make sense considering what the, the what this is designed to do. It's designed as a escort uh, fighter for the rest of Drake's line, and it does it pretty well. Again, rugged, dependable, not as many safe safety precautions, but it's designed to be easy to maintain and uh, function deep in space in the on frontier worlds that don't have a lot of infrastructure. Now you've noticed I said a lot of those those same words over and over again because that's just kind of Drake. But be, those same things that make Drake very Ah, how to put this? Make Drake very 
attractive to frontiersmen also makes them very attractive to outlaws. It's important to remember that in the Star Citizen universe, outlaws don't necessarily mean pirates. They can also mean gang members. It can mean syndicates. It can mean people who simply live outside the protection of the law or rebels against the government. And all of them found a lot of use in a ship that didn't require a lot of extensive maintenance to function, could work, could work long hours outside of any kind of logistics area with simple maintenance to keep it going and didn't require a lot to replace if things got broken. And Drake, being headquartered in Magnus, which was a system that had been abandoned by the UEE, many and Magnus at least felt like it was because once it became no longer advantageous to build ships on Magnus after Magnus had been designated UEE uh, UEE protected or UE Navy protected system there was no no one was allowed to develop the system no one was allowed to, to, to develop the the main planet which was uh, Berea and when the UEE decided to pull up shop and move all of their systems from Magnus to Killian the entire infrastructure of Magnus began to collapse and many companies abandoned the system as it became less and less valuable because it's lost its connection to the Navy. Drake comes in in a time when Magnus absolutely needed help and Drake delivered it. They managed to help pull much of the stagnation out of much of the, the, the planet and the system out of stagnation. The reason why they did this was because they're from Magnus, but also because the other, the reason why they were be able they were able to do this was because they sold a lot of ships. These ships were sold to anyone who needed them, frontiersmen and outlaws alike. They didn't make a big big distinction, and as a result, quickly the Cutlass, Buccaneer, the Caterpillar became almost synonymous with piracy because of how common they were used. To this day, they're still fairly well seen as pirates. Um, at some point, there was uh, about 15,000 people die annually in raids by uh, Cutlass Blacks. So there's still large numbers of, of Cutlass Blacks being used for piracy. Now, they don't have a monopoly on piracy. You will see Gladius pirates. You will see Hornet pilots who are pirates and so on and so forth, and outlaws and such. But the Cutlass is fairly common as for all the reasons we spoke. This got them into a lot of trouble. It eventually caused the founder to have to step down and a new CEO to step up, uh, Aiden, um, Aiden Arden, who was famous for going in and fixing some of these, co these companies like Drake's problems. And has managed to try to revitalize the, the brand in a ways that hadn't been seen before. So with that, let's kind of go in and look at the 2882 Dragonfly. Now this is a more modern update of this, but the Dragonfly is not a bike, as many people believe. It's actually classified as a snubcraft because it also operates in space. Now it's an open top snubcraft, so you need a spacesuit to run it, but it still functions in space. This is a small, short-range utility craft that was designed to work with cutlasses and caterpillars. Everything Drake makes is designed to work together because Drake's whole brand is if you buy one Drake thing, it'll work with all of the other Drakes. It's that kind of synergy that they like to build. It is fairly popular in the frontier for negotiating hot hazardous environments, including space. And uh, they use mostly for transport of personnel, and it has some small cargo capabilities as well. But it's mostly a transport, uh, personnel transport, and scouting, uh, uh, a scouting vehicle. Uh, even though <laughs> the UEE says they don't use any Drakes, there have been images of the U of UEE Marines and uh, and uh, uh, soldiers using Dragonflies, possibly as scouting vehicles but it's unconfirmed right now. So that could be the case. It may not be directly purchased from Drake, though. All right. From here, we're going to go on to... Yeah, let's go here first, and then we'll go back and come our way through. This is 
the Drake Vulture, first released in 2938, only 13 years ago. This is designed specifically to capitalize on the mid-tier market for salvagers. Uh, there are, you know, the Reclaimer has been around a long time uh, from Aegis, but it is a large scale volume. This is designed to help those independent wildcat salvagers or small group operations be, to be able to act more efficiently and independently one on one another. Same kind of mentality as the rest of the ships, but it is instead of a combat oriented or even trade oriented, it is most it is most decidedly a salvage vessel. Now we're going to go over to one of the most recent additions. Meet the Kraken. First developed in the 2940s, the Drake Kraken is Drake's step into its capital class manufacturing. Now, the Kraken itself is interesting. It's the first ship that was developed exclusively by, let's say his name again, Andin Arden, who wanted to use this ship as a way to revitalize Drake's image because the Kraken isn't just a capital ship. It's not just a, a escort carrier, as the it says on the tin. It is also a mobile station. With this, with a Drake, with a Drake Kraken, it's designed to have repair bays, to hold as many, fl it's a flat top carrier, so it can carry as many ships as you can put on it, as well as some of these bays underneath have the ability to be function as a, uh, repair bays, rearmament, uh, or just cargo bays if you need to. And the interior of the Drake Kraken is filled with space for individuals, and there's even a, an aftermarket conversion. I don't know if it's made by Drake. It might also be made by Consolidated Outland, honestly. Uh, called the Krak uh, Kraken Privateer. And the Privateer is designed specifically as a floating uh, station, as a mobile station. So, Drake's hope was to capture the new pioneering spirit which was coming out in the mid-30th century with the release of ships like the, uh, the uh, Pioneer by Consolidated Outland to add additional logistical support for fringe systems. This isn't just another ship that will make do in harsh environments where you don't have a lot of logistical support. This is logistical support. This is something you can bring in and function as a station, as a gas station, as a repair station, as a habitation area. This allows uh, settlers on the frontier to have flexibility and protection with all of this firepower on it as well. That was the idea. We'll see where it actually went. It might just end up being pirate carriers, probably will, but the same idea applies. You're building this big, you're gonna be building this big in terms of it's specifically for, for uh, the good of all. It's hard to say that this is anything but a mobile station. And the last Drake ship we're gonna look at, the Drake Corsair. With this revitalization of exploration, we have the Drake Corsair. This is designed as a long-range exploration vehicle. So if you don't have the cash for a Carrick, but don't want to go so small as to get a Dur, or you don't have the, the, the luxury to get a Drake, or to get a, uh, an RSI Aquila, the Corsair is here for you. It, it is, like all Drake ships, very flexible. It is a cargo ship, but it is also a long-range explorer. It also has more guns than a battalion. I don't know if that's a good, good metaphor. I'm not very good at metaphors. <laughs> it, has, it has a lot of guns, which makes it very dangerous. In fact, I've heard some people uh, complain that this ship is um, overpowered because it's just an explorer, which is funny because it's a Drake ship. All, all the Drake ships have one major role, but they can also function as other things. Uh, so this is a more recent release by Drake. Uh, we'll see how well it does. Um, but again, it's designed as an exploration ship, but have that rugged, ruggedness, utility, 
and lack of safety standards that all Drake ships have. And that's it here from the floor of DefenseCon. Thank you so much for watching us. If you enjoyed this, please hit that follow button if you haven't already done so. I'm sorry, the subscribe button. I'm streaming too much on Twitch. <laughs> that subscribe button. Like the video if you enjoy it. What do you think about DefenseCon? What do you want? Would you like to see other Drake ships? Would you like to hear more about Drake Interplanetary in a more in-depth video? Let me know that and more down below in the comments. And as always, remember, Existoria at Astra.